This is a supercapacitor. It might not look like much, but this little piece of tape on a glass slide has 156 microfarads of capacitance. You can take this idea and you can scale it up to very large specimens, or you can scale it out into different architectures to get different voltages and capacitance. This is all done using easily available tools, namely a cheap 405 nanometer laser and a roll of captain tape, and that's it. So today we'll talk about what's going on here, how this process works, and just have some fun with super caps. So at the heart of this little supercapacitor is graphene, which is maybe not a surprise because we're repeatedly told that graphene is going to save the world and revolutionize society because it has a lot of really interesting properties. It shows promise in everything from solar panels to thermal compounds, energy storage to mem resistors. Like graphene is going to change the world probably someday, but the difficulty is scaling up these graphene processes. So it's easy enough to make monolayer graphene just using a piece of scotch tape or tossing some graphite in a blender. And that gets you really good high quality graphene, but it gives you very small pieces. And the difficulty is scaling that up so you can have a whole solar panel's worth of single monolayer graphene. But that's not what we're doing here. Instead, the type of graphene that we're creating is known as laser-induced graphene. As you might guess from the title, this involves taking a laser, in this case, we're using a simple four or five nanometer off the shelf laser, it's about five watts, but really almost any type of laser works for this application. And we're irradiating Kapton or polyimide. In 2014, researchers found that Kapton, when hit with a laser, will decompose into a graphitic substance. And upon further investigation, this graphitic carbon-based substance was actually a type of graphene, laser-induced graphene. And it forms a kind of a foamy structure where the laser hits the kapton and it bubbles up into an airy, foamy carbon mess. This is very different from the monolayer graphene that you typically hear about, and it has some interesting properties relative to the monolayer. It's not nearly as conductive, which is a shame, but on the other hand, it has much higher surface area because of its foam nature, and that lends itself to being used in catalytic reactions or capacitors, because you ideally want a large surface area to interact with the electrolyte. This process is remarkably simple. Uh, various polymers will decompose into graphene, but most of them require a blanket of nitrogen or other inert gas to kind of keep oxygen out of the system. But Kapton, doesn't have that requirement. If you just hit it with a laser at room temperature under ambient conditions, you get graphene. And obviously if you're using a laser, you can pretty precisely pattern where you want that graphene to go. So this type of pattern is known as an interdigiated electrode where you have one electrode on one side and the other electrode on the other side. And there's little fingers that kind of go in between each other. And in between, those fingers, the electrolyte resides. And this forms the basis of the supercapacitor. And that's really it. You take some tape, lay it down, hit it with a laser, and then add a little bit of electrolyte over the top. I'm using Kim wipes as a sort of substance to wick up the electrolyte just to keep it from going everywhere. The electrolyte that I'm using is sulfuric acid. It's basically car battery acid, essentially. Researchers will tend to use a hydrogel so that you don't need a wicking material. So usually like PVA and sulfuric acid in a gel form kind of placed on top of it. And you can either have this large single electrode or as I showed before, you can start making multiple electrodes and you stack them up. And the reason you do this is to increase the voltage. So the regular single electrode like this gives you about 0.8 volts. Whereas the stacked one here, we have four electrodes kind of in series, will give you theoretically about 3.2 volts. I found it was closer to two and a half, probably just due to my manufacturing and inconsistencies. As I mentioned earlier, to increase the voltage of these capacitors, you just stack more of them up in series, essentially, so that one feeds into the next and each stage of the capacitor increases the voltage. What's slightly different about this type of interdigitated electrode is that it differs from the kind of parallel plate capacitor equation that you're normally used to. So normally a capacitor has two plates of 
anode and cathode. They're separated by some kind of dielectric and the capacitance of the system is the interplay between the surface area of the electrodes, the permittivity of the dielectric between the two plates, and the distance between the two plates. That's not really how these interdigitated electrodes work because it's almost a two-dimensional system rather than a 3D system. That's kind of a simplification, but it really boils down more to the distance between the fingers and the electrode and the total kind of surface area or perimeter along the fingers, as well as the actual porosity of the electrodes themselves. That's actually one of the advantages of this type of interdigitated capacitor or supercapacitor, it doesn't really matter, in that the capacitance can be increased pretty dramatically by just making the distance between the little fingers much closer. And you can usually get the distance considerably closer than you would if you had some type of uh, spacer material in between two plates of a capacitor. Of course, the downside is there's only so much two-dimensional space that you can make this electrode structure. So how do you get more capacitance? Well, you can scale it out. So you just take up a larger two-dimensional area, like I showed at the very beginning, or you can actually start stacking these. And I experimented with this a little bit. You can see here I have a stack of, if I remember correctly, I think this is four layers of Kapton tape, where it's Kapton and then some Kim wipes and then more Kapton and Kim wipes. Of course, at some point when you start having these kind of stacked structures, it would make more sense just to have a single entirely graphene piece of Kapton that then you start to roll up, kind of like a normal wet electrolytic capacitor. Uh, but that proved to be very difficult to manufacture in my home shop. And I did try it with sort of like a packet version and it just didn't work out so well. So I stuck with the interdigitated electrode style. A really neat effect that I stumbled on is watching the capacitance when you add the electrolyte. So you can see here that I'm dripping in the sulfuric acid solution into the center of this kind of packet and it's wicking in through the chem wipes. And as it wicks in, you can actually see the capacitance go from zero and start to increase up to its final, which, I mean, it makes sense because that's how the capacitor works. But it's just kind of fun to see that as it infiltrates across the electrode, the capacitance rises. To be honest, I was a little dubious of the values I was getting out of this capacitance meter. They were quite high in some cases, and I'm not really an electronics person, but it, they seemed like pretty substantial numbers. So I wanted to sanity check this meter and make sure I was getting values that were actually close to being reasonable. The meter itself was quite cheap. I purchased it online five or six years ago, and I don't really have any idea how accurate it is. So I grabbed a few just different sizes and shapes and types of regular capacitors and tested them on the meter. And remarkably, it seems to hold pretty good accuracy. You know, it's plus or minus a decent margin. It's not crazy accurate, but the order of magnitudes all seem entirely correct. So I feel a little bit better about the values that are coming out of the homemade super caps. I think they probably are at least in the right order of magnitude, if not, you know, perfectly accurate. I think we live in a really interesting time right now where we can replicate real cutting edge science papers with essentially off the shelf consumer items. And I think that's just really fascinating. If you also like this type of content, the sort of intersection between manufacturing and material science in a home shop, go ahead and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. Every subscription gives me a little bit of a dopamine hit to keep making these videos, and they do take a lot of work, so I appreciate all the comments down below. Any feedback or suggestions is always 100% appreciated. And as you might be able to see, I have a lot of to-do items, so there'll be a lot more interesting projects coming out in the future. Now, I know this video was mostly about supercapacitors, but there is another variation I wanted to show, just because it was so easy and I saw it in the research and I, I just had to try it. So this is a low voltage, high temperature heater made out of the same laser induced graphene. There are two strips of Kapton tape. It's been fully irradiated so the whole surface is turned into the graphene as opposed to like an interdigiated sort of pattern. And then you put two electrodes on either end, apply low voltage DC, in this case 12 to 30 volts, and you get a really high temperature heater. These things can get up to two, three, 400 degrees Celsius Really the limiting factor is at some point the underlying Kapton 
or the adhesive on the Kapton starts to decompose and then your heater falls apart. So there is a limit to how hot they can get, but it's a really simple process that you can scale up essentially as much as you want and get heaters that can very quickly reach pretty impressive temperatures. Researchers are interested in this, one, because it's cheap and it's very easy. You can imagine kind of a roll-to-roll -roll process where you just roll out the capped on tape with a laser in the middle, turning it into a heater. And the other main reason is that it gives a very uniform heat. So you can see that there's no spiral pattern, there's no wire that has kind of a concentrated heat source. The whole thing is a heater, which is interesting for certain applications where you want a nice uniform heat. So I just thought I'd mention that. It's a pretty cool thing. I might play with it some more in the future. Uh, if nothing else, it's a neat party trick. I think that about does it today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.